Good afternoon and welcome to Washington Week's digital show, Washington Week Recommends. I'm Yamish Alcendor and each week I recommend great reporting that I think deserves your attention. And today I want to highlight a revealing New York Times investigation by reporters Michael H. Keller and David Fitzpatrick. The headline of that story is, quote, their America is vanishing. Like Trump, they insist they were cheated. The piece examines the shared characteristics of the people living in districts represented by Republican objectors. Those are the members of Congress who voted in January 2021 against certifying President Joe Biden's election win. And Michael H. Keller joins me now. Welcome to Washington Week Recommends. So glad to have you here. Michael, I want to start off with just reading some of the incredible reporting that you did. You and your colleagues wrote, quote, a shrinking white share of the population is a hallmark of the congressional districts held by the House Republicans who voted to challenge former President Trump's defeat. A New York Times analysis found a pattern political scientists say shows how white fear of losing status shaped the movement to keep Trump in power. The portion of white residents dropped by 35 percent more over the last three decades in those districts than in territory represented by other Republicans. The analysis also found and constituents also lagged behind in income and education. So Michael, just break down the meat of your reporting. What did you find here? Sure. So we started a few months ago. We wanted to look at the House members who voted to object uh, in this kind of historic vote to reject the results of the 2020 election. Uh, Some of my colleagues uh, examined the how the vote itself came about and the backroom deals that kind of shaped the the nature of the objection. Um, David Kirkpatrick and I looked at the districts and wanted to see this kind of bottom up dynamic. What was happening here? What were constituents saying? um, And what, if anything, differentiated them from other Republican areas? Um, And as you said, we found a few striking things, most notably um, that the white percentage of the population as a share was decreasing faster in these areas than in other Republican districts, and that income and education were lower. Um, That was also tied to higher rates of mortality, which as you can imagine, um, is kind of related to, to all of these things. And you talked about the sort of changes and you broke it down a little bit there about the changes that the districts have seen. Explain a little bit more what those changes look like on the ground, because you had these incredible pictures of sort of racially diverse organizations and people who are meeting in these in these districts. I wonder if you could just break down sort of what are the changes people are seeing on the ground? Sure. Yeah. So we went to um, uh, part of outside of Houston, Troy Nels's district, uh, which is centered in Fort Bend County, um, which has seen uh, pretty much a 30 percent uh, percentage point decrease in its white population since 1990. They've gone from about 70 percent um, white to uh, less than 40 percent in 2020, which is a pretty big drop. Um, And that's largely driven by uh, a rise in um, um, Indian American immigrants and a large increase there. Um, And so uh, a lot of people said to us on the ground that the politics there are often shaped by some of these racial tensions. Um, And even some, Troy Nels himself uses this line while he praises immigrants and says that they're real assets to the community, um, he also says that uh, we need to build a wall around Harris County, which is where Houston is centered, um, which some of his critics and even some of his supporters say is racially charged. You also, in your reporting, as you talk about sort of the the the, the dip in white population, you talk about a sort of mass exodus with some of these places looking like ghost towns. Break that down. Yeah, so the other place that we traveled to for this piece was in Southwest Virginia. Um, and uh, we had these kind of two different trends um, that, but there were also were in some ways were related, um, and that was that these places had lower levels of income or education. Um, one of the political scientists we spoke to said that our findings kind of echoed a lot of what their research said, which is that um, places that are disadvantaged um, or have lower levels of education may feel um, this kind of increased threat from this trend uh, from a white majority to uh, minority status. Um, And as a result, some of those white voters may be um, more likely to reject democratic norms, um, you know, such as, uh, you know, election results or peaceful transfers of power. And in in talking about sort of the fact that they might reject democratic norms, I want to first, because I want to ask you about that part, but what are they feeling like they're losing? When you talk to people and you quote a number of people in this story, when they, when you break down and talk to people, what is it that they actually articulate is that they're losing in in these places? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
you know, I think they they speak to a number of things. They they say that they just couldn't believe that um, you know Biden got this many votes. Um, one person that I spoke to said, um, you know, you you can drive. This was in Southwest Virginia. You can drive from the western tip of the state, you know, nearly 250 miles east, and you know, not see a single Biden sign. Um, so I think you know from from what they told me. It really is kind of a, a conflict of you know what their personal experience is and something that just seems very different and foreign and counters their interest. One of the strong senses that I got when I was in Southwest Virginia um, was that that region has really felt um, you know betrayed for decades and generations. Uh, there was the loss of the coal industry, um, and oh, even at the beginning when coal was was big, there is people told me multiple family stories of well you know prospectors came in. And they, uh, you know, had these really um, predatory land deals, and they kind of took the mineral rights from under us. And you know, those same forces now are coming in and trying to tell us what to do politically. Or you know, the Democratic elites are trying to tell us that this was, you know, the safest election in history, and we just don't buy it. Um, so I think in a lot of these places, it's really not just um, about what happened in 2020, but how it fits this larger narrative where people feel like these interests are really uh, counter to them and their family for many years going back. And in talking about sort of the, the, the effect of this over many years, I want to quote one of the voters that you talked to, one of the residents that you talked to. His name is Don Demmel. He's a 61-year-old salesman. And he said to you and to your colleagues that his parents ways, raised him to be, quote, colorblind. But then in the piece, you say, but the reason for his discontent was clear. And it said, other white people in Fort Bend, quote, did not like certain people coming here. It's race. They're old school. Talk about how that quote, the idea of him saying really out loud that there are people that are just simply uncomfortable with 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 people of another race moving in, how that sort of is illuminated in your piece and indicative of people's views. Yeah, I think, you know, he was speaking to, um, as we say, you know, in the area around uh, Houston um, and was very clear that, you know, he didn't have these views, but that it was, um, you know, kind of the commonly held, you know, old school view um, that uh, this was different. And uh, I think as we spoke about in the piece, uh, there has been a large influx. Uh, we, you know, we visited, uh, my colleague David Kirkpatrick um, visited, uh, you know, a mosque, large mosque complex there. Um, and I think for people walking around from what used to be um, a, you know, kind of rolling farmland is now this uh, more urban area um, and certainly urban with people that, you know, historically did not look like how they did before. Um, I think it speaks to that uh, that difference and what people are are confronting now. Mm -hmm. I want to read part some more of your article um, it's for, for people that are watching. You wrote, quote, because they are more vulnerable, disadvantaged or less educated, white voters can feel especially endangered by the trend toward a minority majority, said Ashley Jardina, a political scientist at George Mason University who studies the attitudes of those voters. A lot of, and you quote her saying, a lot of white Americans who are really threatened are willing to reject democratic norms, as you've said. She also said, because they see it as a pro as a way to protect their status. You go on to write that right wing media commentators sometimes assert that liberals are conspiring to increase the number of non white voters in order to quote replace white ones. So I want to first start off with the with the, the end of that, which is talk about replacement theory. Talk about what that is for people who maybe aren't familiar, but also how that in how that connects to all of your reporting. So replacement theory is this this idea that there's a conspiracy to replace the white population with non-white um, people, um, which obviously is a, a false conspiracy theory. Um, what is true is that, that the share of the white population of the, of the country is decreasing and has been for decades. And I think it's estimated by around 2044, the country as a whole will be minority white. Uh, what we found in our analysis was that uh, there are 12 Republican districts that have already seen that change come about. They've already gone from majority white to minority white uh, for the last 30 years. Uh, 10 of those 12 districts we found are represented by objectors. Um, so I think part of what our reporting, what was interesting was trying to look at these places um, that may kind of have already passed a threshold that the country as a whole is going through. 
um, and seeing, you know, what is it like for people that are there that are kind of living in this future or, you know, seeing things that are happening uh, that are different from from other Republican areas. And I think it was that was, I think, one of the surprising things for us in this reporting, which is on the face of it, we weren't sure if we were going to find really much of anything. Uh, you know, what does a vote to reject election results really have anything to do with demographic change? Um, so it was surprising to speak with, um, you know, to see those the, those correlations and then to speak with political scientists like Ashley Jardina, you mentioned at George Mason University, um, who had said that, you know, these are actually, uh, you know, in some cases can be related. That's fa it's fascinating when you when you do the actual research and find the data and do the reporting to say there is a link here. Um, I want to ask you about and this is maybe a little bit outside of your article, but it's this question that kept coming to me, especially as I as I've covered Trump supporters and and other voters for a long time. The, there's a lot of talk about economic angst within the white community, um, but obviously and, and in some I should say more the data has shown Black Americans, Latino Americans. Um, Native American Americans, they often make less money and they often face more economic challenges at times. Have, did you find or have you found sort of political scientists who say, who can answer the question, well, why aren't Black Americans flocking to, to breaking democratic norms? Why aren't we seeing more Latinos saying, and I know that they've had an increase in the Republican Party, but do we see the same kind of willingness to embrace a breaking of democratic norms by Black people and Latino people who arguably have more economic challenges? You know, that wasn't um, a focus of our or a part of our findings and what we were looking at or what we found. Um, what we did find, though, is, you know, as I said, among the there were 12 of these places that switched from majority to um, minority white. Uh, there are certainly other places that have gone through that that are represented by um, Democratic representatives. Um, so these changes are not unique, but there is a, um, you know, a different reaction, perhaps, among people there. And I think that is what you know, research like uh, Professor Jardina's bears out more um, that I think what re her research has found is that uh, it is more of a um, a sense of a, a white consciousness, a sense of white identity um, that could lead people to uh, feel more threatened with a loss of that status. Certainly. OK, I want to also ask you, you brought up the, the Islamic Center and I want to ask you a bit about about that there. What issues during your reporting did you find were sort of major major voting issues for Asian Americans and Muslim American communities? Because in your article, you talk about the fact that this Islamic Center in Sugar Land, Texas, um, it is inundated oftentimes with candidates who are hoping to speak there, hoping to make their pitch to those voters. I think what was pretty universal was people were generally concerned um, about kind of kitchen table issues. I think I heard a lot uh, when I was in Virginia about inflation. Um, I think as we wrote in the piece, a lot of the um, uh, Republicans there think they can appeal to voters who are business owners, which are a lot um, uh, of them in the immigrant community there, um, who want kind of, you know, more traditionally say, you know, business friendly policies or taxes uh, were some of the main things that came up. Um, that it's, that's a good window into what their sort of issues are. I want to go back to sort of thinking about the voting preferences and, and thoughts of these voters that you were studying in these objector districts. And this is a question really for my team, which is because we were all sitting around talking about this and thinking, well, is this support sort of for denying the 2020 election? Is that in, based on your research and your reporting, is that also possibly going to translate into supporting Republicans who don't stick with former President Trump? Or is this really about sticking with people who are part of the Trump movement and not with other Republicans? Well, that was one of the things that we wanted to look at in examining um, this vote, which I think at the time was, you know, overshadowed largely by what happened um, with the violence on January 6th. Um, but we wanted to kind of take a step back and, and look at it because at the time you saw a lot of um, Republicans really trying to, uh, you know, maybe distance themselves from their vote. But now, you know, some 20 months later, it really has become um, kind of a badge of honor, or even in some cases a requirement for, you know, advancement to to higher office. Um, and I think one of the really interesting findings from uh, my colleague Steve Eater and David Kirkpatrick when they were looking at kind of the origins of, of the objection itself. Um, was it did not embrace the full on, um, you know, there was widespread fraud allegation. 
it was kind of a very narrow constitutional argument that was crafted by uh, Mike Johnson of Louisiana, um, giving his colleagues what he called you know, kind of a third option, that here you can object to the results um, by saying that these states didn't follow the proper constitutional procedures uh, when they changed some um, voting requirements because of the pandemic, um, kind of giving a way to um, very kind of legalistically say, all right, you know, we don't like the process here without embracing the full on um, fraud allegations. Um, you know, but now here we are in November, and I think some people have even then moved past that. Um, and what I think the vote allowed a lot of people to do is kind of it, it instilled this kind of myth of a stolen election. I think we're still kind of dealing with the, the aftermath of that. We're certainly still dealing with that aftermath. And of course, we're only four days away from Election Day for midterms now. Does your reporting sort of reveal what might happen in this next election? I know it's sort of maybe looking a bit into the future, but do you think that these trends will stay? Let's say if we have another contested election where someone says, actually, I didn't win the election. Do you think that these voters might stick with that candidate for some of the same reasons they stuck with Trump? You know, I think what I learned a lot personally in this reporting is that um, a lot of what is shaping the people's views that we spoke to um, is not really something that just happened in the last one year, two years, three years, four years. Um, I think it's it's part of a much larger um, sense, as I was saying, that maybe feelings of betrayal or alienation that have been going back for decades. So um, I think these types of forces are, um, are are kind of here with us or you know have always been in a lot of ways, um, but we're now seeing the results in much starker terms. And it's the quest in some ways the quintal central question of former President Trump, which is he was able to really uh, connect with people who were economically disadvantaged, even though he himself was a billionaire or as some people would say a millionaire. The point is that he definitely had a lot more money than the people who were coming out and saying he sees me, he hears me being at those Trump rallies. People really felt like Trump was speaking to them. Now, of course, there's news that Trump is possibly former President Trump is eyeing maybe making an announcement in, about running in 2024. I wonder if just based on your reporting whether not you think that these folks will still stick with him, whether they will kind of continue to embrace some of these things that you say is, is sort of informed by decades of their life? Yeah, the people that I spoke to definitely um, felt like they historically had not had a voice and that Trump came along and was the one who saw them. Um, and, and then at the same time, they're very quick to add, particularly in Southwest Virginia, it was, you know, most people have memorized all of the slights that they've received from Democratic candidates or people in office. Um, so I think that that is definitely there. I think the other thing that was really, uh, you know, a stark finding that was when we we're looking at the mortality rates, um, the level of, of mortality, and that's kind of, you know, the annual death rate, um, just from, you know, all, all causes, um, before COVID, uh, in these objector districts was pretty much the level that it was in democratic areas in 2020, which kind of means that, you know, just an average day there, um, you're kind of seeing a pandemic level death rate in a democratic area, which was uh, an interesting finding and kind of just for me put in relief of, wow, there really is, um, you know, a lot of real problems that are going on that people feel are not being addressed. Well, certainly fascinating reporting. Thank you so much for sharing it with you. Thank you, Michael, for coming on. And thank you all for watching Washington Week Recommends. You can find us here every single Friday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern. Be sure, of course, to also tune in to Washington Week tonight on PBS. We have to say it again, with just four days to go until Election Day, it's sort of blowing my mind. We'll look at the latest in the battle to control Congress and both parties' closing arguments as key races tighten. Thank you so much for watching.